Well, thank you everybody to this last AOACS webinar of a series of webinars we have organized this month of May uh, to raise awareness about what, how is it living with celiac disease. I really hope that you, you have enjoyed these meetings, all the webinars that we have had. And please don't hesitate to watch them again or share them. They are um, placed in our YouTube channel, so you can find them there. And today we have, again, a fabulous panel of experts that will help us to dive in a quite complex topic. So you know, all of you, that uh, plastic food materials are getting replaced by um, plant-based alternative. And we want to ask our speakers, what is the stake for celiacs? What is going on or what are the potential risks? And for answering to that question, we, we will have like, if you have seen in other webinars uh, of this series, 30 minute presentation uh, with our three speakers speaking, uh, presenting their, their case. And then we will open the floor for questions and, and answers with the idea that we will have, that a, we will have a lively and interactive debate. Um, but before we start, please uh, let me um, give a few words about what is celiac disease and also who we are. So celiac disease is an autoimmune disease that is caused uh, by the ingestion of food uh, containing gluten. And gluten is, um, is a type of protein that can be found in few cereals like wheat, barley, or rape. Um, if celiac disease uh, can affect around 1.3% uh, of the population, and if it remains undiagnosed, it can uh, result in a range of symptoms that can go from very minor discomfort. Some uh, celiac uh, are also uh, asymptomatic, but also to life-threatening conditions like could be uh, severe anemia. And uh, I think what is important uh, to keep in mind is that today the only known effective treatment is a strict life uh, long gluten-free diet. And so that's for that's why for celiacs, gluten-free diets uh, are not uh, luxury or nice to have but it's also, it's, it is a necessity. The Association of, Celia, uh, of European Celiac Societies, AOACS, um, is a non-for-profit umbrella organization. It's made of national celiac societies in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, together with our members, we represent the voice of celiac patients uh, and their relatives in over 40 countries. And we promote strategic partnerships to raise awareness on celiac disease. And we encourage research for providing or for improving uh, the life of celiacs, early diagnose, better access to gluten-free foods and, and potentially find a cure for this disease. The AOACS owns the AOACS standard for pre-packed food products and the cross-grain license system, uh, which is managed by our national cilia societies in their respective countries. And thanks to that system, we allow that thousands of safe gluten-free products are available in the market and can be easily recognized by any consumer. I would like to thank Tequila for having sponsored this series of, of webinars. And I want, of course, thank you all for having uh, follow us during this month of uh, celiac awareness uh, racing and for being here today. Uh, please, I, I don't want to forget, please notice that by participating in this webinar, you agreed that we will record it. So we are already recording it and we will post it in a YouTube channel for public access because that's the idea that we we really raise awareness and, and, and move the, the, improve the knowledge of this uh, disease. Uh, please try to keep uh, yourself mute and, and share your questions in the chat, but also afterwards once we open the floor for questions and answers. And now without further delay, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, 
which family name I will be unable to pronounce. Sorry, Linus. I will try. Linus. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and I would like you to maybe give us like the, the setting of the scene, right? Because this is quite new for us. We might not even know what food contact materials are really. So please, uh, the floor is yours and, and try to explain us what is this about. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Linus Inkvistriket. Very well said, almost. Um, and I work in the Swedish Celiac Society as an ombudsman uh, with advocacy, public affairs, um, giving advice to members, helping, helping people out. Uh, and one of the issues I've, I've been working on for the last, I don't know, six years or so, is uh, contact materials, good contact materials that are, it might be an issue, might not be an issue, but we need to be more aware of it. So. I will start there. So gluten in food, we all know about that. And everywhere maybe, maybe not everywhere, but avoiding gluten, is it straightforward? Is it as easy as you might think it is? Everyone knows, or well, most celiacs I hope, know that gluten is something to, be, to avoid and everyone's making the best, best efforts to avoid gluten. But that food contact materials could contain gluten but it's not as a big thing as it could should have been. And uh, not everyone knows about this. So what is food contact materials? We have the definition from the European Commission. I will read it to you. Food comes into contact with many materials and articles during its production, processing, storage, preparation, and serving before its eventual consumption. Such materials and articles include food packaging and containers, machinery to process food, and kitchenware and tableware. All these materials are called food contact materials. So shortly, materials that could that are in contact with food or could be in contact with food. So plastic was the thing about 70, 80 years ago. Uh, it was fantastic. But quite soon people realized that plastic was also a problem. Uh, we now know that it's polluting the oceans and it's it's a it's a big problem. We need to take care of it. Um, so since at least the early 80s, gluten has been in the focus for examining and developing uh, different materials, um, especially food contact materials that are biodegradable. Um, and what I have found on the internet uh, is from the early 2000s. Uh, a researcher talking about gluten as a main component in food films, like the, the cling films you put on top of food to keep it fresh in the fridge or what you will find food packed in in the store. So I know that it's been at least since then that people actually have been able to apply gluten in, in food films. And, and since then, since, it, that, since they knew that it could be used. It has been used and it has been researched. But the rules that are not very extensive, they say that in food contact materials, no dangerous particles are allowed to leak to the food and contaminate it in harmful uh, levels. So it can't hurt anyone. If food contact materials, for example, contain dangerous chemicals or allergens. Um, so to make sure that these dangerous materials do not uh, leave the food contact materials and contaminated food, they will need to have a protective layer, a coating, to keep the food safe from the materials that you will eat on the, for example, the plate or you will drink from the mug. And gluten, of course, is a very great candidate for making that protective coating that you can find on materials and that could be on biodegradable mugs, or it can be on something completely different that is not biodegradable. So it's not about biodegradability. It's about keeping food safe from whatever is in the food contact materials. And having gluten as a protective coating, I think you can all understand that that might not be the best idea for celiacs. 
Um, so even though gluten and also other allergens as milk protein and uh, proteins from uh, crustaceans have been in the spotlights for alternatives to plastics for decades. Uh, the regulation and control within the EU and of other countries outside the EU has been more or less non-existent. It's just been that it has to be safe. Uh, and how you do that, the, the, the industries have to understand that themselves. So how should it be, be safe? It seems that no one has ever thought of, or at least almost no one has ever thought about the risks allergens impose in food contact materials. They have only thought about the different chemicals or other, other particles that could travel from food contact materials to the food. Um, but allergens has been something that they've used allergens to make food contact materials or parts of food contact materials, but never thought of the allergenicity, like the allergens themselves might actually pose harm. So in 2019, when finally the European Parliament decided to ban plastic single-use articles, the, the Pandora's box of gluten or and other allergens was open and the alternative market for plastic materials that are not made of plastic exploded. So now we have lots of new companies, we have lots of small companies that are not used to assessing the risks of, of allergens, for example, that are producing lots of, diff of different uh, plastic alternatives. Um, and in the EU and also outside, gluten is abundant. That means that there are lots and lots of gluten that is being used as feed for cattle or for other animals. And basically they have to throw away gluten because it's so abundant, which means that if they can find a way to use gluten, for example, in food contact materials, that will mean a big, a big uh, economic thing for farmers and for other companies that produce food contact materials. Um, so we, we also need to know like, what kind of food contact materials could contain gluten, may contain gluten, or contain gluten. So at the moment, we don't think there are many products that actually contain gluten. But we know that there is lots and lots of gluten available. Uh, we know that there is a lot of research done on gluten as contact material and don't really know how it will be used in the future. So there's, there's a need to look into this to make sure that we know the risks and to make sure that there's a, a legal framework um, in place. So you have, of course, biodegradable, that's a risk where you can use um, wheat starch or you can use uh, the, the grains, of course, you can use like all parts from gluten containing cereals, uh, but also non biodegradable materials because you can have, as I said, like the, the protective layer could be made of gluten. Um, so you're not safe if you just stay away from biodegradable in the future. So you need to know what's in these um, materials. And if you see a gluten based or gluten containing product, it's not always very easy to see which is which could contain gluten and which is made of something completely different. So I will show you a few pictures. So you have your cutlery, you have forks on the one hand side and you have cutlery on the other side. It, to me, it's not fantastically safe to choose which is gluten free and which is not gluten free. So the left one is made of gluten containing cereal, it's made of cereal straw. The right one is made of cornstarch. Uh, if you get these in the restaurant, they're not likely to be able to tell you which is made of which if they don't have the picture where it says zero straw cutlery. So it's not written on the individual uh, forks or anywhere. So you need to ask them what it's made of. I would say that there's at the moment is more cornstarch uh, cutlery as, as I found, but gluten containing cereal is also abundant. So that will probably rise. Um, we have these two containers or, or plates that look like they could be made from probably the same thing. Um, one is made of wheat straw, one is made of sugarcane bagasse, um, but you can't really see 
I'm, I haven't felt these with my hands, but I'm pretty sure you can't even feel it with your hands if it's made of sugarcane bagasse or gluten containing, or maybe gluten containing wheat straw. Um, when it's made of straw, the gluten content is probably much lower than if it's made of just gluten, of course. Um, but we don't know exactly how much gluten is in these uh, in these trays or other single-use articles. We also have these biodegradable films that I said that was like developed in the about twenty years ago. Um, so we have five different examples of biodegradable films. So we have fish, gluten, corn, corn and gluten, and fish and gluten. And this is from a paper from 2019, where a um, researcher produced these different plastic films and looked at them and saw if they were um, promising candidates for biodegradable films. And the one that was made from fish and gluten was the best one. The second best one was made from corn and gluten. Uh, the ones that were made from just one ingredient were not as good. Um, but these can be used, and I know that there are researchers in Sweden, for example, that are working quite hard, professors working on making a gluten-based um, film that would have the best properties to replace plastic films. So food contact materials are not foods. And the regulation regarding food information that we'll know that have to be the ingredients in food and you have to have the allergens highlighted in some way. That is not applicable to food contact materials. Um, so th there's no regulation requiring the ingredients to be disclosed to consumers or to retailers or to anyone basically. You just have to make sure as a producer that it's safe. Um, that's the only, like basically the only rule, it has to be safe. So if you want to know what the plate or the cutlery or the straw or whatever is made from, you can't usually find that information. It's not available anyway. You have to contact the producer. So you have to ask at the restaurant, who produced this, this plate? Can I contact them or can you contact them and make sure that it's not containing anything that is gluten containing or that could be contaminated with gluten in any way? Um, of course, the celiacs in the world want to know if gluten is in the food contact materials. The same applies to all other, like if you have a food allergy, you also want to know if, if there's, uh, for example, a crustacean-based plate. That's very important to know. But that is not in the, in the regulation at the moment. Um, that was the same slide, sorry. Um, so, what we need to have is the food contact materials that should be tested for allergens. And at the moment, there's no standardized analytical method to test these allergens in food contact materials. You can test them in food and that is done. So you can see that a gluten-free food um, is gluten-free because you know that it has been tested in the same way. It's the same um, kind of analytical method that's used all over the world. So if it's gluten-free, it's gluten-free. If you test the food contact material, it could be a different method in a different lab in a different country or in the same country. So we don't really know exactly how that should be done at the moment, but this is also something that needs to be done quite fast. And also it's not probably not used in many food contact materials at the moment, but we know that gluten is available. Also gluten straw, like straw that can, could contain gluten is also available which means that this is a market where you can see the future holding gluten in its hands for everyone. Um, and we don't know which, which uh, food contact materials could contain gluten because you don't have to disclose what they're made of. So the potential risks of allergens need to be addressed and assessed. We need more, more, more knowledge. There needs to be a lot of research done and we need to have legislation based on research. And at the moment, there hasn't been much testing done, but there have been some tests conducted uh, in Spain and the Netherlands and Italy. And we will hear more about Italy in a moment. Uh, but there have been tests done by experts to look at the possibility for gluten to migrate to the food from the single-use containers or cutlery. 
So migrate is like it leaks gluten, which it shouldn't. Um, so in these experiments, gluten-free food was put in contact with the plates, like straws and mugs, etc., in a way to stimulate how they are normally used. So like it, it was the food was heated and they were like, for example, on a plate, you would grind the um, the, the fork and the knife on the cut on the on the plate, which means that the possibility to migrate from for gluten to migrate from the plate to the food was much higher than if you just put it on the on the plate and waited for a bit. But that's not how people use plates. Uh, so analysis was made afterwards to see if the food was containing gluten after being used on the food contact materials, because there's no like no standardized methods to come to analyze the food contact materials yet. And it cannot migrate in harmful concentrations. The gluten should not migrate to the food in harmful concentrations because that is the one one clear regulation that it can't be. It can't migrate in that. But of course, it did. Um, in Netherlands, they did some some um, analysis on a soup bowl, a straw, a plate, a fork, and a knife. Um, they had gluten-free food on these, and they used them as like normal people would use these with food. Uh, the gluten concentration went up from below 5 ppm to at the highest 93 ppm, which is much higher than 20 ppm, which is the threshold for gluten-free food. In Spain, um, the analysis was made after using gluten-free food on the gluten-containing uh, um, articles. And the highest level measured was over 80 ppm. We don't know how much higher, but over 80 ppm, which is probably the, the threshold in the Spanish experiments. Um, and I think that's it for me. I just wanted to set the stage to show that food contact materials could be basically anything that food comes in contact with. And the application of gluten or gluten containing cereals could be anywhere in the future. And we need to assess, we need to know what the risks there are. And we need to make sure that these do not affect people with celiac disease or people with food allergies for that sake. So I'm still a bit confused which, which, which materials are dangerous or not, or if there's any dangerous materials at the moment on the market. Um, but I will let the rest of the speakers deepen this discussion a bit. So thank you. Thank you so much, Linus. I Maybe you are confused, but you are certainly enlightening us, really. I, it was a very clear presentation. Um, we show us the horizon, right, what is coming. And now I give the floor to Susanna also, uh, Susanna Newhold uh, from Italy, um, so that you can present the, the experiment that you have conducted um, in Italy. Perfect, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, and uh, uh, thank also to the uh, to the AOECS to take into uh, into account uh, this very important issue. I think um, I may say that the um, presentation from Linus was very clear. Uh, what I should uh, I would like to highlight to underline is that I think that yes, this is a problem. We have to focus on it. But I think that for uh, for once uh, we have taken it in time, because uh, as Linus has said, uh, there are no many uh, as as far as we know uh, food contact materials containing gluten on the market by the moment. So I think uh, we are uh, we are still in time to regulate the, the issue and to protect celiacs. So. By my side, I would like to give a positive message, even if it's very important to act now before this could become a real danger for celiacs. Okay, so now I will go hopefully very quickly through the study we did in Italy uh, two years ago now, but I think it's, it's still very, very actual. Uh, 
Um, so this study was uh, divided into steps. We have a first survey on the packaging materials used for, for prepacked foods and beverages marketed in Italy. And then we made uh, instead a, a migration test on disposable biodegradable cutlery and, tab and tableware available, of course, in the Italian market. So the first survey um, involved 150 companies, the, the, the most important ones in Italy, that marketed uh, prepacked foods and beverages. And this was a, a sample that we considered uh, sufficiently representative of the Italian market. Um, and in this survey, we asked them some questions. And 15% uh, of food companies uh, uh, responded us that they use uh, compostable materials. Uh, of course, now this uh, percentage uh, uh, is, uh, is more, I, I think. Uh, but most of the biodegradable packaging used uh, in Italy uh, were made from paper or corn derivatives, the, the most one, uh, cellulose pulp, wood, or bamboo. <laughs> and uh, uh, these uh, uh, packages were used for many different uh, foods and beverages, both at room temperature, frozen, uh, vegetable, animal origin. So uh, these uh, packages are very uh, transversal and versatile, so used uh, on many, many different uh, food products. And um, the result of the survey, uh, sorry, because... I don't see. Okay. 77% of the companies in the survey use non gluten continuing material. So we asked them, and uh, uh, this was a, a, a good. Uh, a good reply. The, the reply that leave, uh, left us a little worried was this 23% that were at first unaware of whether the packages contained gluten or not. And this confirms what Lynn has just said that uh, uh, it seems that no one, even if uh, in, uh, in the food industry, there is a, so a big um, focus on allergens in foods and beverages, it seems that no one has a thought about uh, the food contact materials. So many companies, they said that we don't know. They Then they made the uh, survey, they asked their, um, their suppliers and uh, only after the survey, they made sure that no allergens were present in the packages. Uh, and only one company out of the 22 that use compostable materials told us that they had required a specific declaration of absence of allergens according to the European regulation on uh, uh, information to, consumer, to consumers on food. Um, and this is... Uh, a little worrying. So only one uh, take it, took into consideration the allergen risk uh, also in the um, in the food contact materials. Sorry. Okay. So the reassuring aspect is that there were no gluten product, no gluten free products, yes, because we asked about the gluten-free products, of course, uh, on the market contained in packages derived from gluten. So this was the, the good news. But the bad news was that uh, one fourth of companies were unaware, so they didn't took into consideration the problem of the possible presence of allergens, in specifically gluten, in their food contact materials. Uh, so information and action on this issue is, of course, needed. And uh, initiatives like this one, um, speaking to uh, food producers, uh, uh, to producers of food contact materials, also to researchers that are doing the very interesting research that we have uh, seen with Linus is very, very important. Uh, the second part of the survey was similar to those conducted by our colleagues from the Netherlands and from Spain. So, uh, and we did it with the Italian Packaging Institute, and this was great because, uh, of course, they have all the know-how and the knowledge on this specific issue of the of the food contact materials. 
because they are the, the society that uh, um, their members are the, the food contact materials producers and the food contact materials users. Uh, so for first step was the collection of information on the most common gluten containing materials on the national market, the choice of materials to be subjected to analysis, and then the evaluation of the results and also the preparation by the Italian Packaging Institute of a, a analytical and documental approach scheme uh, to be used when a food uh, a producer use, uh, uses uh, a food contact materials and would like to be sure that uh, it doesn't is it is, it is not harmful for celiacs. Um, this is the and again a, a good news because only two brands of weight straws and two brands of weight brand plates were found on the Italian market. Uh, we made a survey. Uh, both in supermarkets, both online, and it was very difficult to find these products. So I confirm that for the moment, they, they are very few on the market. Um, we then involved also a, a, an expert analysis laboratory that was um, very expert in the field of testing of food products and also of migration tests of packaging components in food. Um, so yes, I can confirm that for the moment there is not a standard method for the analysis of gluten in the uh, food contact materials, but they uh, reassured us that the, the, the same uh, methodology that we use for food can be used with a sufficient degree of safety also for this kind of uh, materials, even if this should be uh, uh, assessed and validated, I, I think. Um, so first, we assessed with the uh, analytical uh, testing of the gluten content present in the materials. Um, and uh, uh, as we expected, the straws uh, did not contain the gluten above the, detector, the detection threshold, so less than 3 ppm. And this confirms the hypothesis that weight straws should not contain gluten because they come from a completely different part from weight grain, the stem. So uh, this is uh, something that we expected. Uh, instead, regarding weight bran uh, based dishes, the vegetable origin was always well declared in the consumer information, so in the label, in the website, and furthermore, differently, as we saw with the, the, the images that Linus showed us before, uh, we found that these materials were always very dark in color. So they, they were very different from the other ones. So it was uh, easy to, uh, to, to um, uh, see them uh, and uh, distinguish them from the other ones. So these are good news, of course. <laughs> Possibly it is not always like this, but it was a good news. Um, so we choose two foods, a traditional Italian soft cheese, and uh, uh, that we um, used uh, at room temperature and a ready to cook gluten-free lasagna uh, to represent uh, a acidic and fatty food uh, and also a contact at uh, a high temperature, so not room temperature, but high temperature, uh, in order to, um, to uh, simulate the worst case scenario, they were put in contact with uh, these plates for a long time. In fact, the soft cheese uh, was uh, uh, put in the plate, as you can see, for 30 minutes, so it's a long time at room temperature. And lasagna was first heated uh, 35 minutes at 180 degrees and was then placed hot and left 30 minutes, that is a long period on the plate. And uh, uh, that's to simulate this worst case scenario. 
Um, as for the test conducted by the Dutch and the Spanish colleagues, uh, the whey brain dishes uh, uh, show the high quantity of gluten, mm -hmm. more than 400 milligram per kilo, so very high, and the consistent migration, a leaking of gluten into the foods. In fact, we also tested the food before this, uh, this test, so we were sure that they were gluten-free. Um, and we found a quantity of gluten equal to 45 ppm in the soft cheese, that is much, and in the lasagna, uh, higher than 80 milligram per kilo. And this was due, uh, we thought, uh, to the high temperature that can uh, possibly can uh, um, help gluten to migrate better in the food. Um, so, we, uh, we confirmed also with the, the studies made before by our colleagues from abroad that uh, these uh, food contact materials derived from gluten uh, should be avoided by those with celiac disease. This, this, this seems very clear, even if other studies, of course, could be needed. Uh, the only exception is for weight straws, which in fact, being made from the stem should not pose a risk of significant gluten intake. Uh, so the problem is what Linus has already said, the uh, food information to consumer regulation regulates consumer information on food, but is not applied to food contact materials. Um, we had for this fourth step, so with the uh, packaging Italian study, a, a scheme, an approach scheme for food producers um, in order to ask them to check with their suppliers as they do with their ingredients, if there is or not uh, um, some allergen and specifically gluten in their food contact materials because this could be a risk for celiacs and should be uh, communicated to consumer but at the moment as we have said we have no regulation and it is very important uh, to make aware or the uh, producing sector both the food contact materials producers both the food industry both the uh, restaurants because they use uh, this uh, um, compostable, uh, biodegradable uh, uh, tablewares to be aware. So, and uh, meanwhile, uh, we will obtain uh, hopefully a regulation of this issue. So, thank you very much, and I'm uh, available for any question. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. It was also. Uh, putting the, the other side into the puzzle. So we have a, a bigger picture now, but I want to give the floor to the other Susanna, Susanna Anderson. We are very proud to have you. Thank you for, for being available for this webinar. Susanna, uh, she works for the Swedish uh, Research Institute. Um, so from, from the research perspective, uh, what does it bring all that what we have heard until now to your Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was, it's been really interesting to hear, especially your presentation, Susanna, on, on your study, because I've been looking for studies about this, because uh, there aren't much uh, so far. Um, I will share my uh, presentation. There we go. Hopefully. There we go. Um, so, like you said, I work for uh, Rice Research Institute of Sweden, uh, but mainly I work for a member organization called Normpack, which is owned by Rice, uh, and we work with uh, um, materials in contact with food, uh, making sure that they're safe uh, by helping our members to evaluate and assess their materials. So I am in no way an expert on allergens at all. Uh, I'm an expert in food contact regulations. Uh, so, so, so this is a little bit out of my field, but I think it's very interesting. Uh, and I agree that we need to know more about this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the legislation looks today uh, and maybe what gaps that we have and what we need to fill in in the future. So like we already heard, uh, food contact materials or any materials that can come into contact with food 
It could be the processing equipment, uh, packaging or uh, utensils in our home. All these materials contain chemicals and these chemicals might transfer to the food and thereby we get exposed to these chemicals. So it's very important that we know what we have in these materials from the beginning and how much of them that are actually transferred to the food. So therefore we do have a specific regulation for these materials. Uh, I will probably call it the FCM legislation, which stands for Food Contact Materials Legislation, but it's a long word, so I will shorten it. And I just wanna give you a very, very brief overview of how this legislation looks today. Um, and at the European level, we have two regulations. We have the framework regulation and we have the good manufacturing practice regulation. And these two apply to all uh, food contact materials that exist, um, regardless of the material type. So whether it's plastic or it's paper or it's a wheat straw, um, these two apply. And the main, uh, main article in here, which Linus has already been talking about, is that food contact materials must not transfer its constituents to food in quantities that can endanger human health. So in other words, a food contact material has to be safe for the intended application. And I think we can all agree on this. It sounds simple, it has to be safe. But like Linus also said, it, it can be hard uh, to assess whether it's safe or not. And the main approach that we do this today is by using positive lists. And with this, I mean that every substance that we put into a food contact material has to be evaluated and safe for that intended application. So we can't just take any substance and put in a food contact material. We have to evaluate it first before we use it in the food contact material. And then for some substances, we have migration limits. Uh, if it is a substance that could be harmful, then we have a limit on how much that is allowed to migrate to the food. And these positive lists uh, can be found in the material specific legislation that we also have on a European level. Uh, but we, we do have a material specific legislation for some material types, uh, for regenerated cellulose, ceramics, recycled plastics, uh, active and intelligent materials, and also for plastic. And this one for plastic is the most uh, comprehensive material specific legislation that we have today. It includes about a thousand substances that can be used in food contact materials made of plastic. But if a substance is not on that list, you can't use it in a plastic. But as you can see, these are not all materials. We have some materials that we don't have a material specific legislation for today. Paper and board, for example, metals, printing inks, adhesives, and so on. For these materials, instead, we apply national legislations or recommendations. And this is also where it gets interesting, because here we also have the new materials. Uh, and I put new in brackets because it's probably not a new material, but the application is new. Uh, so we don't have material specific legislation for these new materials either. But what I want you to remember, this still applies. They still have to be safe. So sometimes you hear people say that, well, paper and board is not regulated. It is. It's just, we don't have uh, very clear specific requirements, but it still has to be safe. So it's still regulated. And also these new materials, they are, they are regulated. So if we go a little bit further in these new materials then, what could be, well, like Lena said, we have um, new legislation and initiatives that will drive the innovation towards uh, materials that are not containing plastic. Uh, one uh, example of this is the single use plastics directive, which bans few certain types of single use plastics. Um, we have a different, Examples of these new materials, we see plates made of palm leaf, for example, uh, straws made of reed, and also these barriers um, that can be made of different proteins. We have proteins, uh, shitosan from shellfish, gluten, soya, uh, and so on. So plenty of new materials, and these new materials can also introduce new risks. 
And some, well, like a common risk with these new natural materials is that they could be contaminated from the environment. Um, they could pick up metals or pesticides, for example, from the, from the environment, which we need to address. And also it could be a potential allergen maybe. And I want to, <laughs> both Linus and Susanna was talking about that no one, no one has ever thought about these allergens in food contact materials before. And I don't agree, to be honest. Um, I've been working in this field for about, I think it's eight years now. And I know for a fact that the big actors in food contact materials do ask about documentation for the absence of food allergens. Uh, but it is true that the legislation is focusing on chemical composition rather than like the raw material and that there are no requirements for actually measuring the allergenicity. So it's rather handled by documentation from the suppliers. Is your material free from uh, food allergens, for example? So it's not that it's not handled at all, but I agree that it, we need to address it more, definitely. Um, so what do we know then about allergens in food contact materials? Well, I would actually say not that much. Um, what we do know is that we don't have any known incidents at the moment uh, where, where an, an allergic reaction can be connected to a food contact material. And this could be either because maybe the allergenicity is actually removed when you process in the process of making the food contact material. You heat it, for example, and so on. But it could also be that it's very difficult to detect and to trace it back to the food contact material. I assume, um, I'm not a celiac myself, but I assume that if you would get in a reaction, you would probably think, oh, what did I eat? And not what was my food packed in? So I can tell you which one this is. Maybe there is an, an, an allergenicity, or maybe it's just really, really difficult to detect and trace. And I also have a point here, like when I started with very few published articles on this. Uh, I don't know if your study, Susanna, is uh, published, but I haven't found it. Uh, but I will certainly read it now. It's very interesting. Uh, and I think we need more, more uh, science on this. And I want to finish off with saying, even though we don't uh, have any requirements on a measuring the allergenicity of a food contact material today, it might look different in the future. The FCM legislation is uh, under revision at the moment. Uh, and one thing is that they want to shift the focus from the chemical composition of the food contact material to the, the final material as a whole. And also allergens has actually been on the agenda of the public consultation that was held last year. So I don't know in which form, but it's certainly being discussed whether allergenicity should be included in this legislation. And there is still time to actually affect this, uh, this new legislation because the new legislation is expected to be published in 2025 and there will be more uh, public consultations before then. Um, so there's still time, as Susanna said, we're in good time. I think it's, it's the right time now to look at this and, and to gather more information uh, and then also be able to affect the future legislation. And with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, and if you have any questions, absolutely take them now and also feel free to send me an email if you have any questions after this. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. It was brilliant. Um, it gives also a positive note, which I'm happy that, okay, we finally got into, we still have time, so we, we can coordinate efforts and really make it uh, put materials safe for celiacs and other people affected by allergens. I, I'm trying to see uh, if I want to give preference because I have questions myself, but uh, I want to give preference to the audience. Please use the, this opportunity. It's not every day that we have three experts on, on this topic uh, together. So please don't hesitate to write on the chat or raise your hand and we give you the floor.
Um, I don't know if between you, you want to react on your own presentations as well. Now that you have seen each other's presentation. I could add uh, something. I, yeah. Please. Maybe I, I can just add uh, one area where I think we need to have a regulation quite soon. And that is the possibility of claiming that these food contact materials, that there are no standardized methods, analytic methods, to claim that they're gluten free. So we have Swedish raw straw that are made of, um, sorry, it's, uh, rice straw, and they're claimed to be gluten free. We also have, yes, from Amazon, a plate, gluten free wheat straw, uh, which is not really something that you can claim, but it's not illegal because there's no regulation on the gluten-free claims on anything but food. Um, so these are problematic at the moment. So I just want to raise that, uh, that issue. Uh, so if you see something, a plate or a straw or anything that is, is made out of anything gluten-containing that is, is, that is uh, said to be gluten-free, be a bit aware, it might be, but they can't really uh, show that it is gluten-free. Mm. So just one short thing. Thank you, Linus. That's a good... if, if I can then react to that one. Um, those plates that you showed, Linus, I believe, I, I can't tell from that picture, but I believe that that might be plastic, a composite with plastic and something, something uh, vegetable based. Um, and that's actually legal as it is uh, because if it's a plastic, uh, it has to be listed on the positive list of plastic. Uh, it's the same if you've seen these uh, bamboo composites, they're actually illegal as well. They're still out there on the market and that's a problem, but they are actually illegal. And that brings me to your uh, study, Susanna, because I was interested in seeing your plates that you looked at. What do they actually contain? Because it has to be something um, binding it together and that might be a plastic, it's often melamine. And, and if it is a plastic, then it's actually illegal. I can just say these were biodegradable plant-based. Yeah, it, it so often say that, but sometimes yeah. it's like 60% plastic, 60% okay. melamine. So that's also, some, also a problem, uh, stating it's biodegradable, but it's not actually uh, only plant-based. Mm. So there are many problems with those kind of uh, products, actually. <laughs> I, I have a question for you, Susanna. You mentioned that the legislation will go uh, possibly from chemical composition towards final material. Mm -hmm. uh, from that angle, do you think that is more favorable for, for celiacs or not? Um, I, it, it, not necessarily in any way. Uh, it, it has to be addressed specifically for allergens then I'd think. Okay, so it will yeah. be more within allergens. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. There was a hand that was raised. That was hand was up. Yeah, but she has, yeah, she's there. Yeah. Hertha, I give you the floor. Hertha, touch. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Veronica. And uh, congratulations to all these three speakers. It was a very, very interesting presentation. I just want to support what uh, Susanna Neuholt already said uh, regarding the straw. I think we should be very, very careful. Fiber and straw is one issue, which is no dangerous for celiacs. The other issue is the protein, and gluten is only the protein. And we should be very, very careful not to confuse and not to mix up one with the other. And uh, it's, it's very good that we have at least uh, one or two uh, year time to address the European Commission to taking our concern into consideration. But when we address the European Commission, we should be very, very precise and not to mix up straw with uh, wheat protein. This, thanks very much. Thank you. Very good comment. Very good. Uh, Susanna, <laughs> you are the speaker. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thank you, Erta. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, I just wanted to, to say something, to add something. I think it should be very nice to have also a monitor 
by the uh, member societies uh, of the OECS uh, of what is uh, coming into the market. I think this could be very useful because in this moment, the uh, situation is very confusing, as Linus has already said. As Susanna said, uh, uh, possibly, hopefully, in the near future, we will have a better regulation. But in the meanwhile, uh, I think it is important, one, not to um, worry too much uh, celiacs, because uh, I see that many people is very worried uh, from this information. And uh, I'm trying to reassure them that for the moment, the situation is very uh, is very little, very few the products on the market. And this is important. Uh, but to have a monitoring on the market, so every celiac society is, is, uh, uh, became aware of some products uh, with gluten present on the market, and we can share in some way with the coordination of the OECS. I think this could be very useful for the moment. Uh, meanwhile, we have a, a, a better regulation. Absolutely. Very good idea. And that will help us to build a case to be prepared for, for the advocacy. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We have one minute to go, uh, but uh, I so if someone want to raise a question, please do it now. Don't hesitate. Otherwise, uh, well, I think this was only the first step of a series. We we need to keep the discussion. Susanna uh, Anderson, Susanna Newhold, Linus. Uh, sorry, your family <laughs> is so difficult for me. Now we have your contacts. We keep you. We keep this discussion going because definitely there will be an next session on this for our general assembly in November. So absolutely, you will hear from us. We want you there. We want to keep uh, raising uh, awareness on this topic and building the case to make um, food materials uh, safe for for celiacs so thank you so much that was it that was our month of awareness raising on celiac i hope uh, uh, you really make a lot of noise in your different countries and that uh, thank you the three of you for this excellent panel